Well, good morning. Welcome to Rossville Valley Community Church. I'm standing up here in the dark. Um, shed a little light on it. There's always one thing you forget, so luckily that was the only thing, hopefully. Good morning. Glad to be here uh, to worship as, as God's church, as, as the body of Christ here today. Uh, hear these opening words from uh, Paul to the uh, church in Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here today. Uh, Announcements-wise, uh, we will have a session meeting uh, today following the service. And um, I don't know any other announcements unless somebody has some that they would like to present. Madeline, please. <laughs> Thank you. As building and grounds uh, chairman, I'm glad to hear we're having a work day next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Matt, as Madeline said, next Saturday from nine till about lunchtime, uh, cleaning up outside, cleaning up the sanctuary, and cleaning up the kitchen. So those are the three areas of focus. And uh, so that, yeah, appreciate your involvement in that. Any other announcements? Hearing none. Let's prepare our hearts to worship the risen Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we come here today, Lord, for, for one purpose, and that is to bring glory unto you. Father, we, we bring our, our hearts, we bring our minds, and Lord, we come and, and we bring our ears that we may hear from you today. God, that we pray this morning that you would, uh, you would bless our worship, Lord, that our worship would be pleasing and glorifying unto you. The songs we sing, the prayers of our hearts, your word spoken and preached. Lord, may they all uh, work together in us to make us more like your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, please stand and let's be called to worship. This comes from Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O oh, you righteous. Praise befits the upright. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope. Please remain standing and we'll sing our first hymn this morning, which is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 95.
Well, this is time when we enter our uh, time of, uh, of prayer with the body, and uh, we always begin our time of prayer with, with confession. Uh, it's always our, our duty to recognize our shortcomings and our failures. God enjoys it when we come to him humbly, bringing our confessions and our sins to him, laying those before him, and accepting his forgiveness. So let us go now into our time of confession. We will pray silently, and then we will pray together. Let us pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we declare that we need your grace. We confess the desire to be in control and fix everything in our own strength. We confess that we claim you as Savior, but struggle to hand over the reins of life. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we let them go. Instead, we bring to you our brokenness. Instead, we reveal to you our insecurities. Instead, we claim your grace and righteousness over our disobedience. We choose you, Jesus, because you are the true Lord of our lives, and we do not stand a chance in this world without you. We don't stand a chance in this world without Jesus. You only have to walk outside. You only have to turn the news on. You only have to look at the paper or the Internet to, to see that. And, and just to know that Christ is our hope. Rick, Rick's preach, preaching on hope. And I've thought about that a lot this week. You know, Christ is our hope. And his hope is what brings us to this place where we can have peace in our hearts, in our lives. We can, we can actually live in peace in this world that is, that is so in need of it. Let us be thankful that we have hope in Christ. Hallelujah, our sins, they are forgiven. Amen. Let's continue with our prayers of the people this morning, and this is where we bring to God anything that's on our hearts and on our minds, and, and uh, we just bring those to God as he welcomes us. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this great gift of prayer, this great gift, Lord, that, that you lend your mighty ear to even the smallest and and uh, most pitiful of our own prayers. God, everyone is important to you. And Lord, we know that as our Father, you love us, you care for us, and that you invite us, Lord, willingly, right into the throne room, right before you, Lord. There's no barriers. And Lord, we thank you that, that Christ has, has opened that door for us. Hear us now as we come to you. We bring before you the prayers of your people. Lord, we do thank you for your healing power, and we thank you, Lord, that you have, have brought those who were formerly not able to be here, that you have brought them in, Lord, and you brought them in healthy and well. And God, we, we recognize that you are our great healer. And Father, we place all these, uh, these healing prayers in your hands week after week, and, and Lord, what a blessing it is to see the results of your, your hands at work. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We do pray for healing from COVID for uh, for Mike's kids and then, and that they would uh, will just get over this. Lord, we pray that you would uh, make their symptoms mild and, and bring them through this. Lord, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do pray for your hand to be on Rick this week as he undergoes uh, his surgery and Lord we just pray that you would uh, guide the hands of his doctor that they would just uh, perform this this surgery as a just a routine operation Lord let this thing go smoothly and Father give him give him quick and full recovery Lord in your mercy hear our prayers Lord, we do pray for healing for Norm and Grace, that you would uh, just uh, heal them and help them recover from, from this COVID as quickly as possible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do pray for the, the, uh, the people of Taiwan. Lord, we pray that you would uh, protect them. Lord, give them strength and, and uh, allow them to, to stay independent, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we, we also pray that your word would go forth through that country, and Lord, not only there, but throughout this world. Uh, we have so many missionaries and pastors that are out there today, Lord, who are even risking their lives so that your word might be uh, received into the hearts of those who, who don't yet know you. And Father, we just uh, we lift this up today, Lord, that your, your great word that would go out and that many would find Christ and be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, we pray for the families of Hector and Jacob. Lord, as they have lost their lives this week, and God, we just pray for their families, that you would bring comfort and peace into their lives, Lord, as, this, uh, as they go through this very difficult situation of losing their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, Father, we give you thanks that... Uh, brought Yvonne back safe and sound from, from all her travels. God, we have been praying for her and that your safety would be upon her, and it was. And we are grateful to see her smiling face here this morning. As, uh, as we've said this morning, so many are here who have uh, overcome sickness and, and physical ailments. And uh, God, we are just so grateful that uh, you have healed your people and, and brought them here today. We know that there are many more out there there are so many of our our family who is still out um, for one reason or the other god we pray that you would uh, just be able to restore them and bring them back into the church lord where they could fellowship with us and worship with us and uh, god we just pray your your hand to be on them uh, we pray for the ones who are traveling today uh, we pray for traveling mercies and safety everywhere they go 
And Lord, that uh, they would enjoy this great world that you have created and given us as, as this uh, as this gift. Lord, we pray for our uh, our heroes out there, our, our nurses and doctors and first responders, uh, police, fire, armed forces. Lord, those who are risking their lives day by day, hour by hour, uh, so that our lives may be kept safe. Uh, Lord, we thank you for their for their answer to those calls, and and we just pray that your your safety and that your protection would be over them. Uh, we pray for our for our our own uh, safety and health, Lord, that you would keep us safe and healthy during this time. Lord, we've seen, uh, you know, over the past few weeks and months, we've seen an uptick in, in the uh, COVID infections. And God, we just pray for your, your hand to be on us. Keep us safe and healthy and in your care. <coughs> Lord, that we may um, remain healthy. Lord, thank you for this time together as your body. We thank you for hearing our prayers, those spoken aloud and those spoken in the hearts of your people. And Father, now we ask that you would hear our voices as we raise them as one, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'll welcome Pastor Rick up with our next message in the series on hope. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you so much for your ministry and music to us. <clears throat> we're grateful, we're grateful. Yeah, I'm having surgery on Wednesday. I've only had surgery one time. That's when they opened me up like a tuna fish can and had some heart surgery. It'll hurt me, it's no big deal, but appreciate your prayers. It'll <clears throat> I'm really appreciating the health care that we have in our city. Uh, you know, some, not everybody's in agreement with everything that's going on, but I, I have been, I'm just grateful, particularly living in places where there's nothing, or knowing people that there's no way to get any care. I'm grateful for God's provision of that. I think I share with you rather often how much I'm learning from these investigations into God's Word. We've talked about a lot of different topics and everything. We're still continuing. Uh, probably uh, maybe one more Sunday on this matter of hope. Let me ask you, I'm learning a lot. Have you ever heard of the science of garbology? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. Oh, this, there's always one. <laughs> What's that show, uh, Jeopardy or something? Never mind. So there's this guy, he's no longer living, but his name was William Rathja, and he was a researcher archaeologist some time ago. And he was convinced that we can learn a whole lot by our garbage. I'm not making this up. I mean, this is really true. And so he went throughout the trash dumps of the world. He didn't wait 5,000 years to do an excavation, he would go to trash dumps in the U.S. and different places, and he said, you know, we can learn a lot from our garbage. Okay. And so um, he was able, I guess you would say, to find meaning in the mess. Um, and according to Rothche, trash, and I didn't know this, uh, decomposes a lot slower than uh, we think. So he found a steak from 1973 in a package. You know, 30 years underneath that, and it was still there. And he found a newspaper that could be readable from the Truman era. This wasn't that long ago when he did this. And so the point being, Stuff that most of us don't think about or just annoying, he said, there is treasure. There's stuff we can learn. I mean, I didn't know it, but this guy says that 
the landfill in New York City could fill the Suez Canal, or the Panama Canal, I guess it is. So there's a lot of stuff out there. The question I want to talk today, in a fun sort of way, is what would it be like to be a garbologist? I mean, let's think about it. When you gave a street, a, a speech, a garbo would that be called trash talk? You like that one? Oh, no, no. He has to take a business junket down to Orlando, a business junket. Okay. And his wife said, when he's talking about what he's learning, get your mind out of the trash, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay, no more of that. But anyway, he did not view garbage the way we do. He did not. He just didn't. He found gold in the garbage. And so let me ask, the question this morning is, what if we did the same thing with the garbage and the trash and the mess in our lives? Anybody got any junk going on in your life? You don't need to raise your hand. What if we learned to find gold in the garbage? I mean, there are times, and some of us, and we've shared over the years, where the landfill down on the river couldn't hold everything seemingly that's going on in our lives. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but sometimes we just feel overwhelmed. We have felt overwhelmed, a lot of us, with everything that's going on. You know, the COVID, the national scene, like Jim was saying, all the mess that's been going on just seems like it's just overwhelming. Think for a second about the darkest moment in your life. I'm not trying to stir up any negative too many, but just think about it. What was that like? The darkest moment of your life. And I can very quickly re reflect on mine. <sighs> Despair, confusion, feeling like giving up. We talked about that last week and the week before. Things that were going on in the lives of the time of Daniel or in the time of Peter in the early church, they either went the wrong direction with stuff or they just gave up. And that's easy. It's easy for that to happen to us. So this morning, our task is going to consider the darkest moments in the history of mankind. And we're talking about the events leading up to Jesus' death. And we're going to find some clues to how to handle the garbage, how to find trash, looking at trash and find treasure in it. Lord, I pray right now that you would take your word and apply it to our lives and, and take us where we are, Lord, get us where we need to be. Give us hope in the midst of the horror that seems to be going on in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna read this passage real quick. This is out of uh, Matthew 26. This is the betrayal and the arrest. We're going to look at this very quickly. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve of the great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And his betrayer had been giving them a sign. Whoever I kiss, that's the one, that's him. You arrest him. Immediately he went up to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? And then they came and laid hands on Jesus, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant and high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword in place. Or do you think I could not pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen? In that hour, he said to the multitudes, have you come out? As against a robber with swords and clubs to take me, I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple. You didn't seize me, but all this was done that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. We're going to look at the passage in the Gethsemane uh, moments also. But what I want us to do this morning is in the midst of of what was going on in Jesus' life, he was able to overcome. And we're going to have three or four main points that, that outline that. When everybody else saw this humongous cal calamity, he saw the opportunity in it. Because he saw what others didn't, 
he saw what they missed. He just he was able to see through it. He knew what was to come. And a truth that I want us to remember is how we look at life depends determines how we navigate life. So this is Roman number two on your outline, if you've got your outline, I hope. Jesus turned trash into triumph. I mean, somewhere between the prayer at Gethsemane, which we're going to read a couple of verses of it, and the mock trial, this has got to be the most bleak account in the history of mankind. There's nothing that can touch it. Rotten things going on. We'll talk about a landfill. And not one person did any positive thing during this time. No one. No one. You won't find any courage. You won't find any standing up. You won't find, it's just a, a hot mess. Yet through it all, what we want to see modeled by Jesus is that it's possible to navigate life with hope. That's going to be our focus this morning as we move along. So, let's suppose you had been a reporter. And you're just watching everything that's going on. I'm going to read this passage uh, uh, that's coming up, but this is kind of what a reporter might say. Now listen to this. This was borrowed from a book from, by Max Lucado. Last Friday, they welcomed Jesus of Nazareth with palm leaves. Last night, they arrested him with swords. This man's world turned sour as he was apprehended by a crowd of soldiers and angry citizens in a garden just outside the city walls. Only a week since his triumphal entry, his popularity has taken a fatal plunge. Even his followers refused to claim him. These disciples who took pride in being seen with him earlier in the week took flight from him last night. And with the public crying for his death, the disciples denying any involvement, it looks like the future of this celebrated teacher looks dim and the impact of his mission questionable. That might be a newspaper article or an internet blog post if you were just watching what was going on. Listen, God wants to transform each of our hearts. He wants to transform our hearts and look at what's going on in our lives right now in a different way. Jesus' anguished prayer, you could look at it in Matthew 26. We didn't read it, but he said, going a little farther. It says, he fell on his face. Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but you will. We're familiar with the story. He was in anguish. The words are very, very strong. And this wasn't some kind of emotionless prayer. He was in total, total, total anguish. It's been said, never has earth offered such an urgent request, and never did heaven offer a more deafening silence. This is the Son of God. And he didn't have the most rosy life leading up to this. We're aware of that. So to you, the reporter, you're watching. Jesus' prayer is not answered. You say, well, wait, wait just a minute. Unanswered prayer and Jesus don't go together. I mean, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. That's like saying Henry's son wouldn't have a Ford. Some of you may understand what that's Bill Gates' kid, wouldn't, would, he would never get a computer. I mean, that's how ridiculous this sounds. The Son of God, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, is denying his son his own life? How? Yep. And as a result, Jesus had to deal with the reality of an unanswered prayer. Or so it would seem. Many times, have you, have you ever had an unanswered prayer and it affected you in a negative way how many times or it seemingly was unanswered but unanswered prayer is only the beginning look at point two so we've seen unanswered prayer but Jesus got up from his anguished prayer and Judith arrived now this is something I didn't know this is one of the other things that I learned when we think of betrayer what usually comes to our mind Judas. But he wasn't the only one. He gets, Jesus gets up, and there were really two groups that deserted Jesus that night. There was not only Judas, but the crowd. And this is something I didn't know. 
When I close my eyes and I imagine what's going on there in the garden, I see two or three guys with torches. And, you know, there's a handful of folks and the disciples back there. And three or four guys and a couple of priests come up. You know, boom. And it's, and it's over. That's not necessarily what commentators are saying here. In fact, the word uh, crowd is a Greek word that means a group of soldiers. And they're saying this could be hundreds of people. Hundreds of people showing up. So this was a crowd. This wasn't just a handful of folks. And they rolled up there. And suddenly, you're saying as a reporter, well, somebody's going to step up. Somebody's going to pull out a AK. You know, this isn't going to go on. He had brought hope and healing to everyone. He had prophesied. He had loved folks. And there, surely somebody's going to say, wait, 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 you got the wrong guy. Judas is the one you need to be coming after. In his most needy hour, the people that he came to save have come to arrest him. Well, you think the crowd, they didn't really know him. I mean, let's face it, he's got all this, you know, he's all over the internet. Everybody's coming up and seeing him and everything, crowds, and they didn't really know him. They hear him, they see him, they got a few loaves of a couple of bites to eat and maybe got there. No. They didn't step up either. Even the people that he healed them. And then the disciples, point B. The crowd came against him, but then the disciples. They knew him intimately. They knew everything about him that most people didn't know. They had walked with him. Oh, oh, I forgot. One guy, Simon Peter, did try to do something. Remember what he did? Whack. The Gospels tell us that he whacked Malchus' ear off. And Jesus said, oh, you shouldn't have done that here. Mm, healed. Didn't make any difference. I mean, he, he, what was the disciples' attitude? When Jesus indicated his willingness to go, as we just read, they took off. And earlier... They had said, oh, we'll never leave you. We'll never, God forbid, no, 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 no. Remember what Jesus said to him? Listen, Peter, tonight before the cock crows, you'll disown me three times. No, even if I have to die with you, not. Betrayal. Humongous betrayal. John, Matthew, Peter, Simon, everybody. And if you were the reporter watching this, oh, it's all you would see from Judas but also the people that he came to save and his own peeps. So now you've got to write a story about this. You've got a deadline. Paper's getting ready to go to press. And you've got to write a story of what you just saw. Maybe your title is going to be No Kingdom Coming. That's point three. Not only was he finding his prayer unanswered, and not only was there incredible betrayal but well we could put it like this uh, so this is the guy who preached the coming of a great kingdom and we're typing it out it was said he did miracles and he was going to free the captives and this guy can you maybe claim to be the messiah i don't know but now he's got everybody on his case he's been arrested those he uh, had said he was serving they came after him all the, we're in a hot mess period. Seriously, from a, from a human standpoint, Jesus' world has, has collapsed. How many of you are sitting here this morning, you don't have to raise your hand, and saying, hey, guess what, Rick? Our world has collapsed. Our nation has collapsed. Or so it would appear. There are times in the last year and a half where my world has collapsed. It's felt that way. We've been sharing these things. What did Jesus do with the mess that was heaped on him? And that brings us to Roman numeral three, hope in the midst of horror. And this is our takeaway today. 
And you know, it is amazing. I have to share this with you. Each time we've been going through the passages in the last several months, the theme, not just of finding hope, but walking in a manner worthy is always the same. We saw this with Daniel. We said, it's understanding and accepting God's will for our lives. We just got through praying that in our confession. It's being willing to accept God's will for our lives, our kids' lives, our, those that we love. And, it, and then being willing to understand and seek God's purpose. And then finally, resting in his presence. I see this time and time again, whether we were in Daniel, whether it was Peter, whether it was Paul, whether it was, and right now in Matthew, it's the same thing. We're going to go through very quickly. First, he was committed to doing the Father's will despite what is going on. We know the story. You can read it there in Matthew 26 to 39. He was in travail. My heart is breaking. He said, come on, guys. What did the other disciples do? Yeah. And he comes and he says, Father, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. So he was committed to the will of his father. And do you think he knew what was happening? Of course he did. But he did that. He surrendered. He embraced God's, the father's will for his life. Secondly, Point B, he understood and laid hold of God's purpose. So he embraced the will of the Father for his life. And this says in 52 to 54 in Matthew, all those who take the sword die by the sword. You imagine I could not appeal to my Father and he would send more than 12 legions of angels, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled which say, all of this must take place. Of the 98 words that he spoke at his arrest, 38, 30 of them refer to God's purpose. I didn't know that either. Focused on not only accepting God's will, but also the purpose that God had for him. And it didn't look real exciting to most people that were looking. He spoke to the crowds there in verses 55 and 56. You come out with your swords. All this is happening as the prophet said it would, and then they took off. Do you see what he's saying? His world is the proverbial ultimate garbage heap. Not the Panama Canal, but try the Grand Canyon, whatever you want to do. A Grand Canyon full of unimaginable stuff. Smell it. If you were the reporter, you could smell it. What's happened in the space? Of, we, we talked about this at Easter time. What happened from the time he came in on the donkey and then with it? But he did not see himself. It wasn't just, whoa, 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 I'm a victim. He didn't see himself as a victim. He saw that he was part of God's cosmic plan. Acts 2. Paul, Peter in his sermon said, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Notice the predetermined plan. So that's the deal. Jesus knew that this was part of God's cosmic plan. He chose to view and respond everything that was happening as the key events. And we've talked about this every Sunday. The key events, we see them, creation, fall, redemption. Ultimately, the God the Father will take his sacrifice for the sins of the world, not only just to save our souls, but to restore ultimately the entire creation. That's what we're talking about. That's the cosmic plan. Now, if you were looking at this, you were going to say, you got to be kidding. This, this, this thing's over. Bring down the curtain. All of it was the central to the central goal. But then I love this. Look at verse 53. He says, do you not imagine that I could not appeal to my father as he would at once send more than 12 legions of angels to defend me? Earlier in, in, in John 13 to 17, what we call the upper room discourse, the last time he had with the, the disciples, very famous passage, he said, Behold, the hour cometh, it is now come, 
you will be scattered. Every man to his own, and, and you will leave me alone. You're saying, what? What's this guy talking about? And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So there's three points here. He embraced the Father's will. He accepted God's purpose for his life, and he experienced God's presence. Now, as we come to a close of this, Roman numeral five, how then shall we live? What am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? As we've been saying for many weeks, things are a mess. We know that. We don't need to be convinced of it. Everybody is saying it, and it's tempting to believe it, that it's just, there's no hope. I get it. We have unanswered prayers. We, my God, my God, how many times have you felt like God has forsaken you? Why have thou forsaken me? Be honest. We've felt that way at times. It's tempting to see betrayals. Anybody ever been betrayed by anybody? Family, friends, at work? Know what that feels like? Elected officials? No, certainly not. Well, unfulfilled plans. But Lord, I thought we were... Same thing. Same thing that Jesus experienced. Unwanting garbage. So the question for us, what do we do with it? Now listen, if we refuse to deal with stuff that's going on in our lives, for whatever reason and we, we're not willing to trust God with it, it can get stinky. I've been there. There have been times in my life when I just, for whatever reason, just didn't want to deal with it. So first, as we draw this book, we commit to Father's will for our lives. Romans 5, 8, 35, 37. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will it be trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more con than conquerors through him who loved us. I like this. One of the translations says, in all these things we have full victory through God. Maybe we wish it had said, well, apart from those things we have, or not with stuff. No, no, no. He's saying in the midst of all these things, we are more than conquerors. And sometimes that feels impossible. But listen, God desires that we be committed, listen, to his sovereign will for our lives. And that's not easy. This is why we talked last week about the community, the, the importance of community as we bear one another's burdens. We share, as the hymn says, our mutual woes. It's so important that we're together like this and that we are vulnerable and that we're sharing what's really going on. Two, we need to embrace daddy's will for our lives. There's going to be a time when stuff has or are going to happen. Stuff's going to get, the truck's going to come up right in your driveway of life and a huge pile of garbage is going to be dumped in your life. We share about that sometimes. A dump load of stuff in your life, figuratively. And what do we do when we don't see any purpose? It seems there's no gold in that, you say. And when we see unanswered prayer, Jesus submitted to the Father's will. When we fail to see any purpose, he saw the plan of God. Tim Keller said, just because we don't see a reason for why God allows what's going on, that doesn't mean that there is one, isn't one. Romans 5, 3 to 5, we rejoice in our sufferings. Listen, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Spirit who has been given us. You see that? Go back and read that passage. Oh, by the way, on the back of your outline, there's going to be some reflection questions I want you to make sure you spend some time this week looking at about this message. We all need to sit down and, together and, and share it, maybe in a Bible study. 
So we're to stay focused on Father's love and purposes and not the garbage. And how easy it is when you can smell it out your... It's not, I'm not saying this is easy, folks, by no means. Hebrews 12, 2 says, When Jesus experienced suffering, he endured it because his eyes weren't fixed on the pain, but rather the joy that was set before him. There's where his hope was. So the, the solution isn't to avoid the garbage, but to change the way we see it. That's, that's the point of this, our message today. Not to avoid it, but, but it doesn't define who we are. Somebody loses their job because they were doing something honest and they were a bunch of crooks in the, job, in the office. Couldn't do it. Lost your job. Guess what? Faithful to God. We're going to answer to a higher boss or whatever, whatever. Just fill in the blank. So the second thing is to remember, like Jesus, when faced with trials, we know that God has a plan for our lives and that there's purpose in our pain. And then finally, we want to rest in God's presence. This is where it really gets hard sometimes, to rest in all that's going on. I need to hear, I need to hear this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's an old story of a guy. He could have been up there on the side of the mountain somewhere near us. This old guy, he was taking this out. Who knows what he was doing? And he slipped. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's a good illustration. He slipped, and as he was going down, there was this big root, and he grabbed onto it just by a claw in the side of the hill, and he grabbed onto this thing. And he's just hanging there, thong, cell phone, and he's hanging there, help, somebody help me. And he heard a voice. I'm here. Who is that? Almighty God. Yeah? Let go of the branch. Huh? I am God. I have you. Let go of the, of the branch. And he said, is anybody else up there? We laugh. But that's convicting to me. Committing to God's will, his purpose, and resting in his presence. Listen, if we model our lives after the example of our king, we've seen here. If we allow God to transform us, we'll learn to, to have hope in the tough times, folks. I believe we can. Together. And we'll look at the junk and the stuff in our lives, hopefully differently. He wants us to have hearts filled with hope, not despair. Let's pray. Lord, we commit our lives. There's so much. And we, we don't know what this week is. But Lord, your servant, our Lord, who underwent more than anybody on this planet for your sovereign purposes gives us a way to come through it. And we need to trust you, your will for our lives, your purposes for our lives, and then finally, we let go of that branch. And we let you catch us and put us where you have ordained us to be. Get us where we are and get us where we need to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
us be here for each other. Stay in touch. A text, a phone call. Reach out to those that can't be here. Please, visit. Whatever it is, we are here for such a time as this. We dare not forsake this moment to care for one another and to care for those that have no hope. And some of us are living with those folks. So, and now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us, make you perfect in every good work to do his work, will, working in us, working in you that which is well-pleasing in him through Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Greet one another.